Let me know when I should start sharing. Okay. Okay, welcome everybody to Forest Invasives Part 2. We're really excited to continue learning all about forest invasives and their impacts on biodiversity. I'll be your moderator again for this session, so let's get started. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, please leave them in the question, uh, question and answer box, the Q&A box there, and I'll read them aloud at the end of each presentation. So with that, we're excited to have Rachel Kavler from Holden Forests and Gardens join us as our first speaker. Thanks so much for joining us, Rachel. I'll stop sharing my screen and you can get started. All right, thank you so much. Go on, hit the button there. All righty, of course, we didn't start at the beginning. Hold on. <laughs> Giving away all the secrets for later. All right, <laughs> all right looks thanks great. for joining me. Um, we're going to... Uh, go ahead and get into a little bit of regional forest health collaborative uh, tree improvement breeding. I'm the coordinator for this effort, and it's uh, sponsored by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative uh, and the Forest Service. And Holden Forest and Gardens is uh, near Cleveland, Ohio, so that's where I'm coming from. What we do is we connect our efforts together as best we can towards pest and disease resistance breeding. Um, and those activities are focused right now towards three species, uh, ash trees, of course, with uh, emerald ash borer larva there, uh, beech trees with their issues with beech bark disease and beech leaf disease, and uh, hemlock with the issues with hemlock woolly adelgid. Doesn't mean that we won't add other trees in the future, but right now that's what we're focused on. Breeding for resistance really isn't anything new. We always have been breeding for tree improvement and some have also been focused on um, pests and diseases. And while some of these are more across the entire North American region, we're focusing on those trees that are in the um, Great Lakes region. Although sometimes we work with um, um, areas across the, past the Great Lakes because of the range of the trees. And we're doing this because uh, a lot of coordination and a lot of effort is needed in order to, to get um, these trees from where they are now to being more resistant to pests and diseases. We have a lot of different people and organizations that are involved, anywhere from government down to private landowners. I'm here in order to help not just coordinate these people, but give presentations and trainings on how to perform activities that go along with resistance breeding, answer questions that people have, especially about what goes on with um, resistance breeding in particular, and uh, just keep everybody informed on what's going on and what's up to date with our quarterly newsletter and our webpage. Here's the oversimplified process that uh, I think of when I'm trying to explain what we're doing when doing resistance breeding. And you can see here that it's um, got pictures of ash and the background. And um, I'll go through these steps here in order to uh, show you what's involved in the process for all of these, as well as go over where we are at currently with ash trees um, while we're going through that. Uh, with this, we have the overall goal um, for the collaborative is to help increase uh, the resistance in these species so that we have seed orchards and those seeds can then be processed to help restore the forests. So but when we're focusing on those six steps, you can see that right now I have a lot of people who are able to help us out with finding lingering trees and collecting seeds. Uh, but we have a lack of, of places where logistics get in the way of helping out with other sections and sectors. So we're working on uh, co-collaborating and networking and trying to get uh, more funding for those kinds of operations, such as planting orchards. So step one, when you're looking for lingering ash trees, you have uh, specific qualifiers that will let us know whether or not it's an ash tree. Of course, I like to just summarize it as saying it's a suspiciously healthy tree, um, should be in a natural area, a mature tree that's uh, lived past all the other ones, even though the area has been influenced by invasive pest or disease. But you can see we have some specifics that go along with it, uh, you know, percentages of mortality that's hit the area, 
large enough DBH in order to assess that it's definitely old enough to be there when the area first got hit with issues. Right now, we are expanding our areas that we're looking for lingering ash in, and we have some other um, co-coordinators that help lead efforts in different locations. In the Ontario region, you might be um, about the time to look for lingering ash in some areas and other areas not. Uh, but we usually just say it's good to run a, a mortality assessment on ash before you decide whether or not to start looking for lingering ash. Then we have to get some copies into the greenhouse so that we can um, focus on research and um, understanding if we have actually resistance in the lingering tree. So uh, we do that via hot callus grafting, which is a process where you would take a twig of the tree from the woods. And if you uh, cut and apply it right to a potted ash tree and it heals well, you'll have as many copies as, as you'd like. Uh, usually we do this in the winter and we try to add some heat to increase the healing effort. Um, this research had been um, previously shown, method had previously been shown to work by the U.S. Forest Service with American Beach, and you end up having greater success with it. Um, underneath the, the middle section there where the cut has been made, we have some um, soil heating cables that help keep the area warmer than the rest of the tree. From those clones that are able to be uh, grown, then it goes into testing the lingering trees for its resistance. And the Forest Service has come up with this EAB bioassay. And so with that, you have lab reared EAB eggs that are applied to the grown clones that are about four to five feet tall. And um, after eight weeks, you have some destructive sampling in order to see if the larva made it through in its usual way with its full growth. Um, you have a variety of, uh, of uh, amounts of resistance. So sometimes the larva will come out smaller or way less. And then in other cases, the tree uh, puts its uh, able to kill its cells around the larva so that the larva dies. And that's what you see in um, a re the resistance picture there. So that gives us an idea for every clone, um, every lingering ash individual, how well can it fight back against um, EAB larva. Uh, right now, uh, the Forest Service has done this with lots of different um, species of ash and then has tested a lot of lingering green and lingering white ash and a few lingering black ash as well. Um, with that, uh, we're still trying to find more locations where this kind of um, test can happen. And in the future, we're hoping that maybe a different um, assay could happen or test could happen, uh, depending on if we can have uh, genes decoded for this trait. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we, if you have any questions that let me know later, but I'll keep moving on. Um, for the breeding of the, the ash trees, in order to improve that, you have those lingering trees go through their tested stance. You have um, them hand pollinated together in many different families so that you can get uh, seeds from them and then grow the first generation after that to also be tested and selected for best family crosses. Uh, we have uh, a lot of individuals from what we're, I would call the Southern Michigan, Western Ohio uh, population of ash. That's near the epicenter of where this happened. And they're um, in the stage of uh, getting their first generation trees to be old enough to seed. Um, uh, and I think they just maybe had their first collection happen for that, but they're not at the second generation stage of being able to do hopefully more hand crosses uh, with the best from the F1 stage to get into the F2 stage. And from there, uh, you end up having uh, enough, uh, usually enough retained genetic resistance to have those planted trees turn into a seed orchard. When we're planting uh, resistant orchards, uh, you have a lot of different options. It doesn't just have to be that second generation uh, seed orchard, although that's where we'd like to get to. Fenced uh, plantings, of course, is the most important thing because we get a lot of deer herbivory on them. 
But any planting will function as a long-term test for EAB resistance because you are only testing for um, larval resistance when, when you're doing the original test. Uh, we don't exactly have one that will let us know if the beetle prefers the leaves on one tree versus the other or the bark on another tree or the other. And so here you have them planted in rows and that's a uh, all-you-can-eat buffet and we put them to the test over time. This can help in the beginning and new locations where they're just starting to get lingering trees. So you can have them um, plant lingering clones there to conserve um, copies of them until they can get a EAB bioassay done. Uh, you can have them um, grown together so that they're all um, the progeny that's been hand pollinated, or uh, you can just let them wind pollinate and uh, collect the seeds from there to uh, have more individuals to assess um, for uh, resistance. So there are many different options. And right now we have a lingering clone orchard at uh, Holden here, just started one at uh, Cornell in New York and in Wisconsin as well, while um, the Forest Service uh, orchards in Michigan State Nursery had have had some for a while now. Uh, most of these are green and white ash orchards. The seeds are collected and um, we're doing some uh, genet um, not genetics, <laughs> germination assessments right now to know which trees we're going to be able to have great success at germinating. So we have enough trees for a um, future progeny test planting. And um, in the future, we are looking to hopefully have some forest restoration experimental plots. Um, only two have been put up so far just to see if they can um, handle uh, situations near the epicenter of the situation. And as for black ash, that one's been a situation where the tree has become a little bit more um, susceptible, when it's susceptible to EAB, it goes really quick. And they found that black ash has this overreaction to EAB larva. So instead of that little area of dead cells to contain the larva, it will kill a whole section um, of its branch. And so that um, means that it ends up dying quicker. So it's been a little bit of a challenge trying to get the lingering black ash found um, for our processes. So we're Currently, i um, been talking uh, to locations that have high amounts of black ash in order to see if we can get some pre uh, places that haven't had it yet, such as Minnesota, where we can get some samples before anything major starts to happen. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is a partnership that has also um, brought together a whole bunch of other partners and is working on the same kind of uh, structure and workflow um, but more in areas that are on the East Coast of Americas and uh, focusing a little bit more on research that goes along with genetics. Um, and this is helping us out with getting more of the work done, not just for ash, but also beech and hemlock. And so this is the kind of uh, collaborative where you have, uh, you know, me here at the Great Lakes region area, and then TNC is helping out a bit more from, say, uh, North Carolina to Maine. So with that, we uh, can go now into uh, what we have as our back uh, basic information on where we are with beech and hemlock. Um, for beech bark disease, there has had in the past already been beech bark disease resistance um, tests created, and they already had figured out the genomes, so, uh, um, associated genes with that. And uh, then we had beech leaf disease come across to, uh, at the point where we had um, still not done too many of those hand pollinated crosses. So we do have at Holden, which is a weird turn of events near the epicenter of where beech leaf disease started, a orchard that is beech bark disease resistant individuals, and they do have beech leaf disease, um, but we are assess, uh, hoping that we can um, eventually assess to see if they might have like a double resistance uh, effect. Fingers crossed. Um, and then some of those were also planted out into forest ex um, experimental area in Michigan State Park. Uh, and they're still, of, we're still, of course, willing to hear about uh, any suspiciously healthy beech that look like they're resistant to beech bark disease. 
and um, and put them on the docket, but movement of material has been restricted because of beech leaf disease, so we're not getting too far. Um, just a note as well, tree search, if you search for that on the internet, that's going to be where you can search for papers that Forest Service um, individuals have co-authored or authored, and they're all open access to, to get to, so you can find these papers if you want to. Because Holden is near the epicenter of beech leaf disease, we're now starting to see, well, maybe this tree is a little bit different. Maybe that one's suspiciously healthy. Um, but definitely we want to conserve the beech bark disease resistant individuals that we have at the orchard. So grafting has been done in order to make sure that happens. And the researchers here are working towards trying to develop a test um, of resistance for them. There's a whole uh, lot of other research going on with beech leaf disease, and there's a whole research committee that meets every other month in order to talk about that. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can get a hold of me and let me know. Um, but that's basically where we are right now with beech. It's hard to get the um, program for resistance breeding going until we have that testing mechanism. Similarly with hemlock, um, uh, Canadian hemlock or Eastern hemlock is same thing, same species for me. We're trying to de decide what would we call, how would we describe lingering hemlock? And so um, professionals across the um, Eastern region of the US got together to come up with that as well as how would we monitor and process that um, information and look for a lingering hemlock. With that, we had a workshop uh, last April to discuss our what we came up with to see what other people thought about it, and also to talk about past and future research happenings. If you're interested in watching those presentations, that's on uh, the webpage that I'll share at the end. And then real quickly, I got to run through these kind of quick, but we have a lot of different research collaborations happening. The three that I know the most about um, are what's happening here at Holden, where they're trying to optimize vegetative propagation and all these things that will eventually be of assistance with a, a breeding program for uh, more resistant Eastern hemlocks to hemlock willia delgid. In North Carolina, State University there is collecting lingering hemlock that they're finding across the region. Those areas have been hit harder um, for longer down there. And they're also helping with developing a bioassay, but they also have a subspecies of hemlock down there that they're, they're worried about as well. And then also University of Connecticut is working on a lot of genetics work, genome decoding of the entire uh, Eastern hemlock genome, population genetics differences, and terpene assessments, which terpenes are the um, compounds that will show that the tree is trying to fight back against a, an issue, a pest. So please, if you think you see a lingering ash tree or um, a lingering hemlock, I don't know. I, we're not really there right now in this area in the Great Lakes region, but definitely any lingering trees are reported to tree snap and any new occurrences of these pests and diseases go to other apps. And thank you for uh, your attention and hopefully I have a minute. If anybody has any questions, uh, let me know, but there's my information on the screen as well. Thanks so much, Rachel, what a great talk. We do have one minute left, so I'll ask the question. Hopefully we have time, we'll see. We have time for at least one. I'll try <laughs> real there, quick. <laughs> has there been any species of ash that are more resistant to EAB than others? We do find lots of variation in the amount of resistance. So like I said, even on the individual level, you see that. But there is a paper out there that um, shows that there is a bit of a difference in where the, the family lines uh, split off between like the Asian ash species that's used to it and the other ash species we have here. And uh, blue ash is for whatever reason on its own, own little line somewhere else. And <laughs> we see that it has a, a better, a longer chance of um, resisting in the field. So I would say that, um, but um, like I said, it still um, changes on individual to individual level, but right. there are some papers out there you could look for. Awesome, well, thanks so much. We do have one other question in the chat um, in the Q&A box. So if you could go in there and answer that, that would be really appreciated. We have to move on because of time. Yep. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate it. There we go. 
All right. With that, I'm happy to introduce Emily Pastavero next, who is actually one of our own at the ISC to talk about the dreaded spotted lanternfly. Thanks, Em. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Maddie. Um, yeah, dreaded indeed. Um, let me just get my screen going here. Okay, we can see everything okay? Yep, it looks great. Great. Okay, um, so yeah, my name is Emily Pastorero. I'm gonna be uh, presenting to you Crisis, What Crisis? Preparing for Spotted Lanternflies Arrival in Ontario. Um, so basically I'm gonna speak to you about how we put together a crisis communications plan for uh, spotted lanternfly last summer. Um, so what I'm hoping is that the demystification of that whole process will um, just help you understand what is actually involved in confirming and communicating the detection of a novel invasive pest such as this one. And I'm also hoping to instill um, a bit of an appreciation for the communications and coordination work um, that uh, is involved at all stages of invasive species management from prevention and detection to eradication and control. So um, I'll get everyone on the same page about what we're actually talking about. Um, spotted lanternfly, which I'll just refer to as SLF, is an invasive insect in the plant hopper group. So um, it's not a moth or butterfly like it might look like or a fly like the name might imply. It is um, a plant hopper. Uh, it's native to parts of Southeast Asia and became invasive in South Korea and Japan and more recently in the Northeastern United States where it was first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014, um, which is where it kind of uh, starts to pose a bigger problem to us in Canada. Um, it poses a, a really big threat to our vineyards mainly, but um, orchards, forests, and parks uh, can also be impacted. And basically the idea is that it weakens and kills plants um, through its feeding behavior and also through the excretion of its waste, which is a uh, sugary sticky substance called honeydew. I'm just going to run through some photos here. These are what the egg masses look like. As you can see, they're pretty inconspicuous, just kind of looks like a smear of mud. Um, the egg masses in particular can be spread um, unnoticed very easily. Uh, next, once the eggs hatch, um, spotted lanternfly becomes a nymph. Um, it goes through several nymph stages. So it starts out as those very tiny little black nymphs with white spots. Um, a little later in its life, it gets bigger and um, turns bright red with uh, white and black spots. And then as an adult, it becomes kind of a very pretty, more charismatic um, insect that you might already recognize. Um, you can see in the picture on the right there just how it compares in size to uh, the nymphs. But it is a, a very distinctive insect as an adult. Um, so we like to say that, you know, invasive species um, impact uh, our economy, environment, and society. Um, this could not be more true of the spotted lanternfly, which definitely does all three. Um, in the United States, SLF has proven very costly to get under control. It's a really hard insect to manage, um, even when you're not directly managing an infestation, just implementing best management practices to kind of uh, monitor and prevent spread has been very expensive. There's also, of course, the direct um, yield loss, especially of grapes. Um, they really like grapevines for some reason, um, and so... Uh, Growers in the United States have experienced um, immense uh, losses of, of their grapevines. Um, and then in terms of the environmental impact, this is a really generalist feeder. Um, they've been noted to feed on over 100 different plant species, including hardwood trees that we value. Um, and that's because it, it's, it's a plant stressor, basically. So even though it doesn't um, outright kill everything that it feeds on, uh, it can reduce the resiliency of the host plant to other pest diseases and pressures imposed by um, the climate changing. Um, and then, of course, besides the feeding, there is also um, its honeydew secretion, and that honeydew will gather at the base of a plant and foster the growth of sooty mold, which is not good for the plant's uh, photosynthesis. Honeydew also uh, impacts us. Um, there have been uh, anecdotes of people, you know, walking under a tree with spotted lanternfly and, and honeydew is actually falling on them. It's very sticky and unpleasant. Um, also attracts uh, bees and wasps. Um, they aggregate in these huge swarms and just on the whole kind of cause discomfort for people who are just, you know, visiting and, and trying to enjoy natural or green spaces. So this just kind of gives you an, an idea of that. So, you know, that is the sooty mold on the left gathering at the base of a host tree. And on the right, we have a tree. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually the trunk is basically covered in a swarm of uh, spotted lanternflies. 
So in terms of the threat that it poses to Canada, uh, we mainly consider this to be an agricultural pest. Um, it does have the potential to unfortunately devastate um, grape and wine production. Um, so I've got, you know, a picture of a vineyard there. That's kind of what we're really worried about. However, the forestry industry is also vulnerable um, because wood products and the machinery and the whole process associated with that are really big vectors of spread, especially for those egg masses that I showed you. Um, so the Spotted lanternfly can really be transported anywhere in Canada, theoretically, um, via like trucks, for instance, but um, some regions that are fairly vulnerable are southern Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. Um, even though it does get cold here, of course, we do have a suitable climate because those eggs can overwinter at fairly uh, low temperatures. Um, of course, we do have the presence of uh, grapevines. We have lots of vineyards in Niagara region, for instance, very vulnerable region, um, and also lots of other plant hosts. I have um, Tree of Heaven pictured there in that corner. Um, I took that photo myself in Toronto. Um, it's an invasive plant from the same part of Asia that uh, SLF is native to, and um, it's quite widespread in uh, urban and suburban areas. And then, of course, we are very uh, close to the U.S. border where there are large um, breeding uh, populations of SLF. There have been also multiple sightings and interceptions in Canada over the last few years, and I will clarify what I mean by that, because these terms um, do have kind of very specific definitions. So I have them in order here of um, severity, basically. Um, so I'll start with a sighting. So a sighting is, is simply a report that someone has made of SLF in Canada that um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA, is aware of. Um, they've usually seen it uh, made on some kind of website could be um, iNaturalist or a social media site, um, but it's not confirmed by the CFIA. So it's just, you know, a, a sighting that we know of. Next, we have an interception. Um, so that is, it can be a live or dead SLF, um, but this time it's confirmed by the CFIA, but it is in a contained situation, um, such as, you know, a, a warehouse, and there's no evidence of release to the Canadian environment. So there was a picture on the previous slide, it, it looked like an SLF kind of behind some plastic. Uh, so that was one that was found in a warehouse um, last year, uh, but it, it was there, it wasn't you know, released into the environment at all that we know of. Next, we have a detection, which we have not yet had in Canada. I want to be really clear, we haven't actually detected SLF in Canada yet. What that means is that there has to be a live SLF confirmed by the CFIA in the Canadian environment. And I have a big red arrow pointing at that because the detection is what would trigger our crisis communications plan into effect. Um, I'll of course, get uh, more into details on that momentarily. And then, of course, uh, what we really don't want is an established population, which is evidence of a reproducing population, again, in the Canadian environment, in the wild, confirmed by the CFIA. Um, if you'd like, you can actually go over to uh, the CFIA's webpage, Observations of Spotted Lanternfly, and see where there have been detection, or sorry, interceptions and sightings so far um, in Canada. And it tells you, you know, the month, the year, and, and town that it was found in. Um, and detections, uh, when and if that happens, will appear on that webpage as well. It is uh, updated. Okay, so before we get to our crisis comms plan, um, I wanna talk about early detection and rapid response because it, it kind of hinges on that. Um, and this is a key tenet of invasive species management. It places emphasis on, um, of course, detecting uh, and reporting on invasive species early, especially through community science, which means that um, you, know, you all have a role to play. Um, and basically the idea is that the earlier species is detected, the more likely it is that eradication or at least effective management is possible um, and a lot less costly at that stage as well. So we come to crisis, what crisis? Um, despite no confirmed detections to date in Canada, sightings of SLF in uh, 2023 did put us at the Invasive Species Centre on pretty high alert. Um, at the time, the eventual discovery of an individual or even an established population almost seemed inevitable. So we wanted to get ahead of it. Um, and so we developed a crisis communications plan, which can be crucial in mobilizing the public to be on the lookout for a novel pest, enabling that early detection and rapid response that we need. Um, I did name my talk today after a super tramp album. Um, however, that has nothing to do with SLF and the metaphor there stops here. So um, when I went to start to put together uh, the crisis comms plan, um, I did thankfully kind of have some scaffolding to work with. Um, so I was building on the uh, materials and plan for Oakwilt, which had been unfortunately detected in Canada for the first time 
uh, last June. Um, so, you know, definitely learned from that experience, but uh, we took it as an opportunity to develop a collaborative plan and materials for SLF well in advance of any reports um, and collaboratively as, as well with our partners. We we're just allowed to take a little bit more time with it, which was great. So starting with um, a media release, which is kind of the first component that we worked on. Um, a media release uh, is sent out to media outlets, so this isn't something that just goes out to the public. Um, it's meant to communicate accurate information in a timely manner. Um, it's a shorter document. Uh, it gets, you know, it's meant to just get really crucial information across quickly, concisely. Um, we have information to encourage the public to learn more and take action, because of course we want the media to communicate that information to the public. And we provide quality resources so that if they need to know more, um, we're, we're putting them in the right direction. So this is uh, the anatomy um, of a media release, basically. Um, if you can imagine kind of a, a news article with you know, a, a very punchy to the point headline, um, and then some extra info in the subheader, uh, kind of do the same thing here. We say, you know, for immediate release and the date, and then we just have a bolded first sentence, just, you know, bare bones communicating, spotted lanternfly has been detected in this town in Canada for the first time. Um, and then we have a little more information. We don't go into too much detail, but we do have that, you know, key messaging from the CFIA, uh, detection and reporting tips, why SLF is a problem, um, any additional resources and events that we want to promote. Um, and then, of course, we have some photos, background on us, and uh, contact info for, for further questions. Uh, next, we have a pest alert. So this is something that gets sent out to the public, sent out to ISC subscribers and any other relevant groups within our network. Um, it's a little longer, has a little more detail on the pest itself, um, but we do keep that consistent key messaging and reporting instructions. So for the anatomy of a pest alert, um, not totally dissimilar from the media release, but does kind of have a different purpose, um, has a little more details of like the detection, how to reduce spread, a little more about the biology of SLF and, you know, maybe some more photos. It's a bit, it's a bit longer than the media release. And then we also have everything else. Um, so one of the first things we did actually was uh, set up a timeline and you know key steps following the notification of a suspect fine. So just to kind of give us a roadmap of you know the sequence of what happens after follows a detection. Um, we also kind of prepared uh, some updates for our online materials. We have tons of stuff like posters, fact sheets, and the species profile, which would be out of date the moment there is a detection. So we were prepared um, to update those very quickly. Uh, we put together, you know, our list of like key contacts, committees, uh, plan for notifying stakeholders. That's, of course, very important in light of a detection. Um, we started to do some preliminary preparations for a couple different events. So, you know, we might, for example, do a workshop in an area where um, SLF is detected, or we might put together a Q&A panel webinar, um, which is actually what was done for Oakwilt. And then we had some pre-made social media posts and photos already put together so that they were ready to go in light of a detection. Um, so, uh, I'm of course um, telling everyone to be on alert for this pest. I would be remiss to not uh, tell you how to do that. Um, so, the CFIA wants you to spot it, snap it, catch it, and report it. Um, so, in terms of spotting it, uh, you can use our online resources to learn how to recognize SLF at all life stages. Um, in the spring and summer, uh, you would want to be on the lookout for those nymphs and adults, but you can actually look for SLF year-round because those egg masses are going to overwinter. Um, so, you can keep an eye out for those. Uh, of course, take uh, photos as best you can of the specimen. You also want to catch the specimen, um, and that's because the CFIA needs to confirm it in the lab. Um, so if you find egg masses, that's pretty easy. You can just kind of scrape them into a plastic bag or container. If you find a nymph for adult, try to put that into a sealed container. You don't need to keep it alive. You can just kind of stick it in your freezer. Um, it doesn't bite or sting, so you don't really need to worry about that either, but it is uh, important to get the specimen if you can. Um, and then, of course, report it. So you can report um, to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency either online or over the phone. Um, you want to get as precise location information as you can, any habitat or host plant information, whatever you have, you're going to want to report that. 
Um, I won't spend too long on our um, additional resources. If you just go to our SLF species profile online, everything is, is linked uh, conveniently on that page. But I do just want to touch on our online spotted lanternfly training course. Um, this is part of our uh, training program, um, but this one is actually free of cost. So if you're curious about our training program, um, this is a good one that you could you know, try out to see if you like it. Um, as with all the other courses, it is um, virtual and, and self-paced. Um, it, uh, it goes into a fair bit more detail than the species profile. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, it really is open to anyone. We kind of designed it for you know, stakeholders, but um, really anyone who is interested can take this course. And if it applies to you, you can receive continuing education units from the Ontario Certified Crop Association or the International Society for Arboriculture um, if you are involved with either of those. So that does uh, conclude my presentation for today. Um, my email is on that slide there. Happy to take um, any questions now or if you would like to email me later. Thanks so much, Em. Great talk. If you have any questions for Emily, please pop them in the Q&A box and I can read them out to her. Um, I will mention too, um, like Em already talked about, uh, we did have quite, a, we do have quite a lot of experience now working with crisis communication plans. We had a, quite an extensive one built for Oakwell to now we have one for Spotted Lanternfly. So if you ever do need advice or tips on how to get one started for your own organization, uh, please feel free to reach out. We can definitely assist with that. So there haven't been any questions coming in just yet. Oh, just kidding. There's one right now. Um, are the egg masses located on trees? Yes, they can be laid on tree trunks. Um, they can be laid on pretty well any hard surface outdoors, natural or artificial. Um, and the thing with them being laid on trees is that um, they can be laid pretty high up where you're not usually going to see them, unfortunately. But um, yeah, they do lay them on, on trees. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Em. I'm just reading through the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. Seems like there's a lot of comments in there. I did leave links in the chat for everybody as part of Em's talk. Okay. Oh, we've got some more now. How different are the egg masses to spongy moth? Um, it's pretty different. So, and actually, I I do kind of like a photographic comparison in the um, online course so you can see. But uh, the spongy moth is actually named after um, its spongy looking egg masses. Like they are kind of yellowy and like spongy looking. Um, the SLF egg masses look a bit more like kind of a smear of mud. Um, it's just kind of like grayish. It almost looks a little bit like a lichen, um, which could confuse it with that as well. But um, yeah, if, if you kind of compare some photos, I think you can pick up the difference pretty easily. Yeah, definitely. Good tips there, Em. Um, if Tree of Heaven is invasive, should we be reporting and removing it as well? Yeah, we definitely, well, we definitely encourage um, reporting it, um, we encourage reporting of any invasive species, but if you can report um, Tree of Heaven on EDMAPS, um, it's, it does help us to kind of put together um, data for like where it is, and then we know where SLF could potentially um, establish. Uh, that being said, it doesn't necessarily need tree of heaven to complete its life cycle and there are plenty of other um, plant hosts here. Um, in terms of removal, it, it kind of depends on what the situation is. If you have it on your own property and you are able to get an arborist to remove it, um, that's great. I know it's invasive itself and a lot of people kind of don't like it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it's it's not necessarily feasible though to totally eradicate tree of heaven from, from our environment. It's actually, it's been here for two or three centuries now, so. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty tough. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll do one more question here really quickly. Um, what is being done in the U.S. to help control spotted lanternfly, and are any of those controls here in Canada? Oh, that's a good question. There's a lot of things. Um, a couple things are being kind of trialed that I don't think are being trialed here yet. There's um, people have tried like vacuuming up um, spotted lanternfly. Uh, I think there's trials of dogs um, being trained to sniff out um, the egg masses, uh, which as far as I know is also not happening in Canada yet. Um, they are unfortunately using uh, pesticide control um, where needed, uh, like in vineyards, for example. 
Um, and we don't have um, approved pesticides for the most part for SLF yet here. Um, hopefully we don't have to um, worry about management to that extent, like since we've had time to kind of get ahead of it. But yeah, mm -hmm. those are things you're doing in the US. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, I really appreciate your talk. We'll have to move on now, but there are a couple comments um, and questions in the Q&A box and in the chat. If you could just go through and answer those, that would be super great. Thanks so much, Em. Okay, so last but certainly not least, we have Joe Bowden from Natural Resources Canada joining us to talk about his latest research. Thanks for being here, Joe, and you can start whenever you're ready. Thanks, Maddie. Um, okay. Is that okay? Um, we, we can see your notes onto the side there, so you might just have to switch views. Okay. Is it that one? Perfect, yep, looks great. Great. Hi, my name is Joe Bowden. Um, I'm a research scientist here in Cornerbrook uh, with Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forest Service. And uh, so, yeah, first I would like to acknowledge the land stewardship uh, by the Mi'kmaq people in this region. Um, I would also like to uh, thank the Invasive Species Center for this opportunity to uh, present one of the loves of my life. Um, fitting that it's Valentine's Day, I suppose. Um, my others being kids, cats, and wife, and don't tell the cats I put them second, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so this uh, section is called uh, Forest Invasives, but uh, this uh, project is really uh, focused on, um, well, two things. Uh, one, uh, data acquisition. So um, where are, uh, I, I view this as a really good uh, detection tool and uh, understanding where species are distributed, uh, but also a very simple piece of infrastructure in which to engage the public, especially uh, kids I, you know, and, uh, and communities and things about the importance of insects, especially those that are positively phototactic. So it's really a, um, uh, a framework or a, a platform in which, uh, yes, invasive species could be detected, uh, but also, uh, you know, if there's questions about forest uh, biodiversity, um, uh, macro moss, that sort of thing, then those kinds of questions could be addressed by this, this framework as well, on this platform. During the last uh, four or five years, uh, I've been, well, maybe even six years now, uh, I've been working on understanding um, questions around the, this, uh, this er eruptive forest pest uh, species, this eastern spruce budworm. This outbreak began in the island of Newfoundland around 2018, and the uh, province, so we work closely with Parks Canada and the, and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, who are the, the largest uh, landscape managers in this region. Um, the province in 2019 or 20 entered into uh, this early intervention strategy for uh, spruce budworm management, where they are treating uh, a number of forest stands with uh, BTK, Bacillus thuringiensis, variety Christaki, which is a, a, a lepidopter aside or a bioinsecticide that's used to, uh, to knock down populations of uh, th these uh, eruptive insects. Um, but it, it could have uh, potential non-target impacts, of course, on things like macromoths. So we've been um, working in this framework to understand uh, what are some of those potential non-target impacts um, of, of the macromoths, because of course, those moths are uh, serving a lot of important ecosystem services out there in our forests. So they serve as important pollinators. We're learning more and more as a scientific community that Moths uh, are potentially more efficient pollinators than bees and flies and other things out there. Um, and uh, pollinating a lot of the flowers and things like that, that bees and flies are not doing, so different things as well. They're also um, herbivores, so you could view herb herbivory as a positive or a negative response, but um, this striped garden uh, caterpillar, I almost called it spider. I've worked on spiders quite a bit too in the past. Um, is feeding on salix here. Uh, and sometimes these insects can, can become quite eruptive. So um, this is a, a branch of a, uh, Eastern spruce budworm. These, uh, they also, moths also serve as an important food source for a lot of migratory birds, bats, and many other things like other arthropods, spiders, um, wasps, and, and, and a lot of other things out there. So it's important to keep, keep these things in mind. There are also, um, we've seen that they're very 
sorry, canaries in the coal mine for, for climate change. So uh, like many other insects, their physiology is, is directly driven by external temperatures. And this drives ultimately things like phenology or the timing events and the, the lives of those individuals in, 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 in situ in a given area. Uh, but it can also drive um, the redistribution of species northward, for example. So we see, uh, we know from uh, Fenoscandia that from colleague, colleagues uh, like Yanni Epson and, and others working on a native, the native geometric assemblage over in Fenoscandia that, uh, you know, these moths, once they, they finish uh, sort of obliterating the birch forest, they've now uh, started jumping on to uh, the dwarf birches and clearing out, as you can see in this before after, dwarf birch uh, forest, uh, well, dwarf birch tundra really for all intents and purposes. Um, and feeding on that or using that as a host resource. Um, we also know from things like the Western spruce budworm uh, and even the Eastern spruce, the current Eastern spruce budworm outbreaks that these most recent uh, native species outbreaks have occurred much further north um, than, than ever uh, recorded before. Um, out of the, the, the really good data, I'm super envious of the, the data that uh, Britain has for their larger moths. Uh, we know, and, and a lot of this has been collected through uh, community science endeavors so, uh, since the 70s. So they have really good data over time, uh, understanding what's happening to uh, a lot of their macromoth species. Overall, they're seeing a, a decline in the overall abundance of species. Um, yeah. Perhaps not so surprisingly, those few species that are actually rising are what we would call uh, pest species. So those are really good at uh, exploiting human augmented landscapes and climate change and things like that. Um, so again, I, I hope I've made the case that it's really important to try to understand um, the that other those other moths out there that we're not always thinking about. Um, and, uh, and don't actually, frankly, have a whole lot of, uh, of data for, but I think um, this Mothwall project serves as a, 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 as a good framework in which we can uh, engage the public and, and also collect meaningful data to understand the distribution of some of these species. Um, this, I think this just reiterates the fact that I, I love them. And uh, anyway, the St. Lawrence tiger moth. Um, so again, I, I was, uh, postdocing in Denmark some years ago, uh, and a good friend of mine uh, there, Mayana Graverson, who works as a has a, 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 a museum uh, at the Natural History Museum, also works at the state park, so they manage their state parks as well. Um, and uh, she she had this idea to uh, develop this light wall to uh, in, 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 uh, engage the public, especially kids, about the importance of moths. So they, she started having uh, mothing nights at one of their uh, national parks. And I, when I did move back to Canada, I just kept thinking, how can we begin to detect, document, and identify um, this important group of insects that is super diverse? We've got, we're talking about uh, 160 plus thousand species globally and, and somewhere between 5,500 and 6,000 species in Canada. Um, that for the most part, we, we don't have a whole lot of data about uh, even the distribution of a lot of these species. So this is uh, Mayana sitting here in the center on the right. This is uh, at the light wall, uh, the moth wall in, in Denmark. So uh, she, she really uh, inspired this idea to uh, that I sort of built on to um, uh, to to bring to bring uh, to Canada and to try to build on. Um, uh, so I thought this was a great and simple piece of infrastructure where it's just a lit wall with, so this just a, a board painted with a bit of sand in it for substrate and, a, and a, here she's using mer mercury vapor light to attract, which emits at a very broad wavelength, so it attracts a lot of different species. But um, I thought, well, there's ways in which we can, um, as a scientist, in which I could gather some really meaningful data if we could get a whole bunch of people across the country or broad spatial scales to use uh, something as simple as iNaturalist, which is growing uh, ever so much. And of course, the machine learning algorithms in iNaturalist are getting better and better all the time because the more um, images we put in there, the more it learns about those species and is better able to detect uh, and identify those uh, uh, identifications. Um, instantaneously back to the public when they take a picture with their phone. So uh, we can get, you know, really nice geo-referenced data points. Uh, this was a very early on <laughs> photo of the, of the page that I created. So I did create an iNaturalist uh, page about this project. Um, and 
you know, we can, yeah, we can get really nice points. I, I piloted uh, a moth, a light wall, a moth wall just in, um, uh, in parts of Newfoundland uh, for the first couple of years. And uh, I, you know, we spent, uh, I took my oldest son and we'd go camping and, and spend the night because he loved it because he would get some, some snacks and things. And we just turn, wait for the light to come on. So we, we had it on a, on a photo cell uh, to come on when it was a bit dark and, um, but you can have these on timers. So we've, we've got them all on timers now, but um, just wait for these things to arrive. And, uh, and we just had, I think he, he was really excited about uh, the moths showing up and we, you know, we would ID all the moths as they came. So uh, it, it's a great, I think a great uh, way to engage uh, kids about and get them excited about insects as well, whether they be uh, invasive species or, or uh, some of these pretty things that we had on the left there. Um, so in 2021, I want to say, uh, uh, maybe 2020, I established this light wall in Berry Hill Campground, uh, which is located in Grossmore National Park here on the west coast of, of Newfoundland. Um, and as you can see, it's just a, a light wall. We now use these uh, lights that are um, uh, black light fluorescent um, bulb. So uh, just like a CFL um, black light bulb. So it's just a light fixture. And uh, and a and a, a piece of uh, part of a, a piece of um, uh, board uh, plywood that's uh, painted with uh, a light gray paint with a bit of sand in it and uh, for substrate. So um, we also I think I have some photos later, but we also developed thanks to uh, I shouldn't forget uh, acknowledging uh, Bridget Richard, who's uh, one of our uh, comms people in here in, in Atlantic Canada that really helped. Um, push this along in terms of getting um, some signage put together. We, we, we took uh, quite some time to develop um, these signs in, in French and English to, to uh, put out the, at these uh, parks for people to learn about the importance of moths uh, and how they can contribute data to this iNaturalist project here at the bottom. Oh, that's just a small video I put in, so I, I won't... Uh... Um, but yeah, so I, I, and, uh, you know, we reached out to all kinds of parks uh, staff in Atlantic Canada, and I went on a whirlwind moth wall establishment tour back in 2022. Uh, and so we, uh, we put light walls or moth walls with signage in, in most or many of the campgrounds, at least in, in Atlantic Canada. Um, and Parks Canada staff are super excited about this, this collaboration as well, because it, uh, you know, it provides them again, a, a tool or a, a piece to engage the public and have uh, some, some nice public engagement opportunities um, throughout, the, throughout the summer months while, while campers are there. And um, I started now doing on um, Moth Week, uh, National Moth Week, which is the, about the last week of, in July every year. I, I started now giving, going to Grossmore National Park where we, where we give presentations and I had a nice captive audience of about 40, 40 some odd campers in the cook shack in uh, Berry Hill Campground um, uh, just last year because it was uh, raining quite a bit all day. Luckily it, it let up in the evening. And so we actually got something like close to 30 species or around 30 species that night that we, that we were able to, to document. And I get some the kids were really excited about this opportunity. Uh, to learn about moths and, and, and see them come and arrive at the, at the light wall. Um, so here's a good, I, again, I just a, a photos of the, the, um, the uh, signage that we, we've put together in collaboration with Parks Canada. For those of you that work in the government, I think you sh would appreciate the time and effort that we put in this and, uh, and it came out really uh, fantastic. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is uh, moth wall submissions or moth submissions. Actually, I just ended up yeah, pulling out uh, all Lepidoptera submissions, but, but just to highlight where we have established moth walls so far uh, in Atlantic Canada. Um, but I've been since contacted, uh, actually a couple of years ago, contacted by uh, some folks in Ontario Parks. So there's a couple of, there's at least uh, moth walls in some of the campgrounds in Ontario. I don't know where exactly, Northwestern and somewhere in the South. Um, but uh, some colleagues in the states, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, Florida, are putting moth walls there too, and in other parts of Canada, Quebec. Uh, so it's growing, and I, I'm excited about this because, yeah, I'll I won't spoil my dreams. Um, so uh, some some really nice early uh, sort of wins, I guess, if you will, or uh, early proof of concept is that we did detect uh, new records within uh, the first year, actually, that we put these up. 
Uh, so banded tussock moth in in, uh, in in one of the sites in in, in uh, Newfoundland, uh, and and um, a lar the large wainscot moth, which was introduced into New York some well, well over a hundred years ago, but it's been moving northward constantly. Uh, so these represented new provincial records, and we've actually had a few others since. Um, on July of third uh, or so of last year, I was contacted by uh, uh, someone at Kujabak National Park, a parks interpreter that was ex super excited about um, this massive um, uh, arrival of uh, Luna moths one night that they, they were so excited to be able to show these to campers and uh, again, and just talk about the importance of moths and how, how just how beautiful these things were. And so I think even that, it just exemplifies the, that, that this could, can work. And uh, uh, I think with a little encouragement, we, uh, you know, getting people to post pictures to iNaturalist um, is, is going to be where this pays off from a scientific perspective or data perspective. Um, the kinds of data that I, I do envision that we could uh, achieve out of these are simple things like flight phenology over time. If we get lots of um, observation or consistent observations over time, we can start to look at trends over time. Uh, but also, again, just basic information on species distribution. So this could be of use to groups like COSIWIC. Um, you know, I'm, I'm contacted every once in a while and uh, about uh, various groups in this region. And unfortunately, there's a lot of gray, gray or in, insufficient data on a lot of these things. Um, and, but it, you know, it can also be uh, a, a nice detection tool. These are in campgrounds. This is a lot of the first visitation spots when people hop off of uh, the boat when they come to the island and that sort of thing. So if people are transporting um, potentially alien invasive species, then it's a, it's a great opportunity to detect them. Lights, these lights, of course, also detect things like serambicids and a lot of the other beetles and things like that too. Um, sorry, Maddie, uh, where to next? So my dream is like the, the, the red chair uh, program, which is, if you live in Canada, you know that the Red Parks Canada has these chairs and all the most beautiful landscapes or the uh, viewscapes across the country. So I'd like to see this sort of uh, roll out across the country. Uh, we've started putting these in, in smaller uh, communities and in some in some rural parts of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, I've, I've had the chance to go and chat with kids about this. Uh, they're super excited about bugs and um, just at a local scale, there's all kinds of fun things you can do or targeted uh, searches if you're looking for targeted um, you know, species. Uh, I think AI will play an, a really uh, nice role in this uh, going forward. And I'm on a working group internationally to develop the automated, uh, some automated systems for the detection of, of, uh, of uh, moth species or well, of, of, of light attracted species. So this is a, an, what we're calling an AMI unit and uh, it's, this is a, a uh, there's a Raspberry Pi back here. This is a, a 4K camera taking images of this, of this uh, setup every uh, 10 minutes and then uh, also motion detect. And then ultimately we've got a, a great machine learning group that is uh, developing a process where these images, so the, the advantage is INAT one-off pictures, the machine learning is very good. But in these kinds of situations, in theory, we could put out one of these systems in the field, in the in the woods, and it will detect moth or no moth, and then ultimately um, uh, have a, a species uh, designation and a confidence about that species ID. Uh, we can get summary data and uh, for each trapping uh, event. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. Maybe I'll I'll talk about immunis later uh, next year. Um, but I'll just leave with some photos of moths and I think I'm sorry for taking so long. <laughs> no, that was great. Don't worry, Joe. Thank you so much. Really cool, really cool research and uh, great talk. We have a number of questions. I did put your email in the chat because I don't think we'll definitely not right. get to all, to all of them. Um, sure. So please email Joe with any follow-up questions. I will try to read out like at least two here for you. Okay. Um, were you able to detect any new moth species or invasives um, with this method? Uh, so yeah, so other than the, the, a few new records, there's nothing that was particularly invasive. Uh, that large wainscot, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not particularly invasive, but uh, but nothing like super serious yet. But again, I think if we've if you if you build it, they will come. Kind of scenario, uh, literally, if you put some white walls up, <laughs> the moths are going to come to them. But we, so I think the the infrastructure can be there. It's very simple to put. It's 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 very cheap to to put together, uh, if you're interested, email me uh, and I can um, explain this. But. Definitely, yeah, still good for detection for sure. 
Um, we'll take one more question here. Curious if you find that some of the insects have trouble clinging to the wall versus a sheet. Uh, no, it's, I think with, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think, I think actually they, they do fine. Um, I've, I've done sheeting a lot too, uh, but I think this, this, this board with the sand in it does, does very well um, for, for, for th these things hanging on. Perfect. That's awesome. I'm so sorry, everybody. There's a lot of great questions. Um, we'll have to have you back again next year to talk more. <laughs> sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Thanks so much, Joe. If you have any questions, please yeah. follow up with him. And uh, yeah, we do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a quick break here and meet again at 240 for part one of our monitoring policy innovation session, where we'll hear about some exciting updates from MNRF and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. All right. See you all then. Thanks so much.